Hello and welcome to Checking the Vitals, a podcast powered by Specialty Care. I'm Todd Schlosser, and today our guest is Dr. Resnick, an amazing orthopedic surgeon out of the Orthopedic Group in Connecticut. In this conversation, we touch on his strange path to orthopedic surgery, how approaching situations with an inventor's mind led to his many patents for medical devices, and both the different types of AI and how it is changing the industry. Enjoy the conversation. So I'd like to start off by asking what it was that sort of drove you to want to have a career in healthcare. So was there like a quintessential moment that you decided, hey, I want to be a doctor? Yeah, this is, a, this is one of my favorite questions to answer because oh, yeah. I think um, sometimes in life things look like a straight line, but really yeah. they're really kind of jagged. Absolutely. And occasionally a serendipity occurs, and then that moment of serendipity, something changes and it changes the whole direction of your life. Absolutely. And for me, there were several moments of serendipity. One was I was probably about six or seven years old and I was sick and my doctor was seeing me as a house call mm -hmm. and he was on black and white TV on Face the Nation at the same time oh, wow. discussing this new vaccine that he had worked on. And I was watching him on TV as he was giving me an injection. Oh, wow. And I was enamored at that moment of I'm sure. the whole thing. Uh, but not growing up in a family of any physicians or even anyone who ever went to an Ivy League school and almost everyone went to public college who went to college and most of my father's relatives didn't even get to go, that was never something I thought was remotely possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I finished high school with very lopsided math and English scores, didn't mm -hmm. know why. Yeah. Uh, ended up going to engineering school because that was really the only good school I can get into because of such a discrepancy between my math and English abilities. Right. And ultimately there, I needed to have a job because I didn't have any money. Right. Um, so I had a bunch of different work study jobs, but eventually landed one as the engineer for a project studying sudden infant death syndrome at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. Yeah. Actually a baby's hospital. Yeah. And in that group, I did the computer stuff for them. And I was an engineer, mm -hmm. and I did the computer stuff. And When I you worked. say computer stuff, do you mean like sort of IT-related stuff? Well, it wasn't really IT at all. I mean, you think about computers now, you think about IT more than anything, yeah, absolutely. right? But really what it was is we had a plastic container that was quite good size and yeah. round, and we actually put babies in the container, and the container had controls for oxygen and carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and sensors for those levels and also a way of measuring the baby's breathing and right. their heart rate. And in the process of doing that, you had to collect the data. Right. And if you can imagine, back then, the computers weren't that sophisticated. So we had, no. we had a fixed drive and a floppy drive. And the yeah. floppy drive was this big around. <laughs> and it was actually a hard disk. Yeah. And it can carry three megabytes of information, which was... Wow, that's wow. nothing. Wow, yeah. that was like unbelievable back yeah. then. And in <clears> one three megabyte drive, we can get all the data from a, a one hour sleep study on babies. Oh, wow. And they were okay. studying some infant death syndrome. At the time, crib death. You know, people, yeah. babies went to sleep. They didn't wake up. We didn't know why. Sure. Uh, and they were trying to figure it out. Yeah. And the whole thing about keeping your baby upside down or right side up is all related to those studies that were done back then. Right. In the process of doing that, at some point along the way, I'd written a paper about how you measure CO2 in babies and errors, mathematically errors in a computer model of what would go wrong with that based on the type of sensors and the engine, chemical engineering I did, so the type of chemical engineering problem was. And then after finishing that, one of the doctors came to me and says, have you considered going to medical school? And I said, no, I really didn't think that was a possibility. Sure. And he said, we think you'd be a very good doctor. We'd like you to apply and we'll support your application. Wow. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but it's something you had never considered up to that point? You know, I mean, I had that magical moment when I was a kid and I never thought sure. that it was possible. So maybe in the back of my mind says, wouldn't it be wonderful to be that guy who gives the injection to the kid and he's on TV at the same time? Because <laughs> sure. when you're six or seven years old and you see that, that's like, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, miraculous, you know. I mean, like, oh, he's in TV and he's in my room, you know. Like, yeah. as, at that age, I couldn't really figure that out. So it always stuck in the back of my head. Right. And so I said, well, what do I need to do? And he said, well, you need to take the MCAT. And, you, and sure. you know, and being a chemical engineer, I had already taken calculus and physics and chemistry sure. and organic chemistry. All those classes were already under my belt. Yeah. And all I do is take two bio classes. And uh, one was genetics and one was uh, biology, you know, zoology, biology. Yeah. And um, I did those classes and took the MCAT and got into Yale. Oh, wow. Of all places. Yeah. Um, no, I've heard of that school. Yeah, yeah, some people. So I got into Yale, and and then that was fortuitous as well because it turns out the reason there was a big discrepancy in my scores and the reason why I ended up in engineering school as opposed to a regular college, one of the main reasons was is that it turns out I'm dyslexic and yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know it. So when I got to Yale and I was a student, the f good thing about Yale is they have a lot of small seminars. Mm -hmm. 
And the way the classes are run, you have a large class and then you have small seminars, but all of your grading activity and everything was based on your performance in a small seminar. So not like a big survey class. No, but. and it wasn't big exams. There were no required exams in a sense, but every, oh. but you were in a group, two professors and six kids, and they sure. grilled you in the room. They yeah. knew what you knew and what you didn't know. You didn't have to do a written exam. <laughs> yeah, the student to professor ratio right. was so low. That yeah, they really it, it was that. pretty intense. And some of the people were actually Nobel laureates or going to get a Nobel Prize that wow. I had my, and I purposely... I was enamored with that idea, so I purposely Absolutely. went out of my way to, to have a Nobel laureate as one of my preceptors, <laughs> yeah. which was not always to my advantage, uh, as you can imagine. Yeah, I'm sure. But, um, but, but there was a lot of fun things about that. Yeah. I, th I met my wife, and we were dating, and her sister was a special ed teacher. One day she's giving me directions, and I'm writing them down, and she's watching me write, and I'm doing my usual scribble that no one can see, because I'm a doctor, right? <laughs> and, and, um, and misspelling some words and whatever. And she says, you know, there's something wrong with you. And I said, what do you mean? She says, I think you're dyslexic. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. You yeah. know? And, I mean, and when was that? Like, what? This what? was in medical school. Well, yeah, but what, what year was that? Sorry. Uh, what year was that, 1981? Maybe? So dyslexia wasn't really a commonly diagnosed thing no, until mid to late 80s. No, it was not diagnosed. And not only that, I was always above grade reading level in, in English. Sure. And. No one really knew this, but what I was doing is I was memorizing words. I never was really reading them. And mm -hmm. for my first grade teacher, thought I was brilliant. My mother tells this story. She said she thought I was brilliant. And then what it was is as I, I look back now, knowing what I was doing, yeah. I just memorized what people said when they turned the page in the book, and I just repeated it when I saw the picture. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's what I was doing in first grade. You can get away with that. Yeah. But in third grade, you have to actually read. Yeah. And she was my same teacher again in third grade. She told my mother I was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you know, you started out, I thought your son was very smart, and now yeah. I don't think he's smart at all. Well, that happens to a lot of dyslexic people. And yes. I've talked to some people who uh, grew up with that, and they, uh, I had a friend who said he looked at the words and tried to memorize them as pictures. Because it helped him if he focused on that, like the word the just being the picture of the word the, and it just helped him focus on what it was, yeah. which I thought was very interesting, and it's a very difficult disability to struggle with. And, and, and I never really knew it, but math yeah. is easy, and yeah. you know, and and verbal communication was not hard, sure. and and even being creative uh, verbally is not difficult for me. Yeah. So, so I, I bruised through all that, and then Yale was a seminar format, which was great for me because yeah. you don't have to write things down. Yeah. And and so Yale was a perfect medical school. For me. I didn't know that at the time. It was again <laughs> serendipity. I mean, it was there, and it turned out it was perfect for me. Yeah. Uh, and then she diagnosed me and did all these tests and said, "You're pretty badly dyslexic," but I'd already gotten so far, and she said she doesn't know how I did it. Well, wow. and truthfully, it's because I kind of, you know, like I said, things look like a straight line. Well, I yeah. went, I went to the places that were easier for me mm -hmm. by default, but ended up looking like by design, right? Yeah. So here I am, an engineer with some computer expertise in medical school. Now, what do you do? Well, oh, let's look at the different specialties that require some technology, right? At the time, sure. So is that how you whittled your uh, specialization to orthopedics? A little bit, you know, I didn't like dealing with mucus that much, you know, and they <laughs> crossed that off the list. And, right. And sort of, you know, the other bodily fu fluids were a little unappealing, you know? Sure. So I said, okay, what's left? So there was radiology, there, right. there was ophthalmology, and there was orthopedics, because all those had a lot of science. Right. You know, ophthalmology is a lot of optics, you know, mm -hmm. radiology was, you know, different parts of the digital stuff. CAT scan was just invented. Yeah. It was very exciting. Yeah. Um, so all that stuff. And then orthopedics is very mechanical. And I, my dad was an engineer and also a master carpenter, and he used uh -huh. to build furniture on the side. I learned how to build furniture. I taught woodshop when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I'm back in the tool shed, fixing people's bones with screws, nails, and plates. Right, the tool shed's just a little bit nicer and cleaner. Yeah, much nicer, much fancier, <laughs> a lot more expensive. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then I'm an engineer, so the physics of it, the mechanics yeah. of it, is all very appealing. And all of a sudden, I found myself, oh, this is perfect for me. Yeah. And again, more physical, more three-dimensional reasoning, less right. words. I'm not mem memorizing 500,000 pharmacological numbers and names. Right. I'm looking at the structures and trying to figure out how they work. Right. And so for me, that became sort of magical, and that's where I ended up. Yeah, and it seems like with your specific skill set, it's like perfectly in your wheelhouse, and you sort of took a very strange pathway to get there. Yeah. But it seems like the way your brain works is... It's like the perfect place for you to be, which yeah. I think is super interesting. Yeah, it just it just worked out that way. And, you know, it's like do what you love, or love what you do, or, or you know, whatever it is. But, yeah. but um, you know, sometimes you, you get the marriage of things, what you can do and what you love to do ends up being the same thing. So that, yeah, that absolutely. Always, it worked out really well. And it, it's interesting with that uh, diagnosis of dyslexia, you went on to like write two books 
Yeah, so that's an overcompensation, right? So <laughs> okay. I, one of my frustrations was uh, I like the idea of being able to put ideas down in words and mm -hmm. be able to have some impact. And at some point, my son, my son decided to become an organic chemist. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to go into medicine because, you know, whatever. And, right. and I said, even if you become an organic chemist, why don't you do MD, PhD? He said, no, Dad, I'm not going into a hospital. I have no interest in hospitals. Sure. And he said to me one day, he says, listen, dad, you only help one patient at a time. If I wake, make one molecule and cure a disease, yeah. I'm going to help millions of people. It's not bad reasoning. So when your son says something like that and you say well, like, okay, there's the challenge. <laughs> it's like, how do you leverage what you know to help more people than you help now? Right. And, and there's several ways, right? You can make inventions. You can change the field sure. that way. Yeah. You can write something that's helpful right. for patients. You can write articles on a national level. So mm -hmm. the last 10 or 15 years, I've really kind of turned some of the things around in that sense that I'm looking at. I know how to do certain things. Maybe I do them a little differently because of my background in engineering. Sure. Uh, but maybe some of that's worth sharing on a bigger scale. Yeah, absolutely. And you've done that. I mean, you've yeah. written the two books. Yes. Um, and you've done a lot of work with AI, which I'd like mm -hmm. to talk about at some point. But mm -hmm. you've also uh, had a hand in kind of creating new instruments, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so how yeah. did you how did you get into that? I mean, clearly it helps to be have an engineering background, right? Yeah. But did someone come to you with a problem and you were just excited to solve it? Or did you see a problem that you wanted to solve? How did that whole thing come about? So so the, the thing for me in invention and, and the way I, the way it kind of happens is I'm doing something and I, and I see, it, you know, I wish we could do this better. Right. And then, you know, so you look for people who are doing it better and maybe there are tools out there you don't have and mm -hmm. you kind of dig around. And then the problem just ruminates with me, you know, like, ah, oh, this is just stupid. Why can't we do this another way, yeah. you know? There's got to be a better and way. There's got to be a better way. Um, and then usually I wake up with something. Usually wow, like, really? Like I'll wake up in the morning, oh, this is interesting. I'll be in the shower and I'll take another 10 minutes in the shower thinking about it. And, and then sometimes an idea will bite me and then I can't let go yeah. of the idea. And, um, you know, one of them, one of the, one of the earlier ones that actually J and J picked up was my grasper grabber for, for surgery mm -hmm. for, um, there are several different small instruments for shoulder surgery to manipulate sutures. So initially when we did shoulder arthroscopy, you really couldn't do much. We looked, then you open the patient. Sure. Then you looked, you do a little clean up and then you open the patient. Then mm -hmm. you look, maybe you could put some stitches in if you're careful and you could do something and you, then you open the patient anyway. Right. At some point, we said, like, look, we should be able to do this and figure out how to do it. But then you have to invent a whole new series right. of instruments to do it. Because you can't fix it with technique. You have to do it with an instrument. Well, you, we have to have techniques that match the instruments right. and the instruments match the techniques. I mean, right. there are certainly ways to MacGyver anything. And that's a little, there's a little joke about me in the OR that they're willing to give me almost anything, even if it's broken, because they know I'll make it work, <laughs> which is not, you know, what I expect. But, right. But, but occasionally in the operating room, things happen, you're yeah. out of control and you have to MacGyver something. Yeah. You have no choice. You face a problem that you just don't have the instrument Absolutely. for because there is none. You and know? you sort of have to roll with it. You have to roll with it and you have to be creative. And, mm -hmm. and that's a little bit of the creative side of me. I like that. Uh, but then every once in a while I finish that and I go, oh, I wish there was an instrument for that. And so one of the things happened early on was we used to uh, use suspension to hold the arm in the air. Mm, okay. And uh, you, originally, when first, and no one will believe this, but originally first doing shoulder arthroscopies, and this is in the um, late 80s, we actually had a hook and a pulley on the ceiling and a rope. Oh, wow. And you tied a little gauze and, and a muslin and a hook, and then you put that on the rope, and then the rope went to the ceiling and a weight on the wall, and then you did traction, and that held the arm in, in zero gravity, if you will. Sure. And with the arm in zero gravity, it's easy to look inside the shoulder and move yeah. it around while you're looking and check yeah. everything. So that was great, except, you know, how do you, how do, you do that all the time? You know, to have to, every operating room has to have a hook in the ceiling or a pulley <laughs> and a rope. It doesn't right. make sense. How do you make that portable? And there were, right. there were a couple of devices out there to do a little bit different version of that. But most of them were fixed angle devices. In other words, you, they were set up, you hooked it up, and just like the ceiling, it wasn't moving. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't it be nice if that was totally variable, if you had full six degrees of freedom and you mm -hmm. can put the pulley anywhere you want in space and therefore position the arm. So if you decide yeah. while you're operating, gee, I'd like the arm abducted more, rotated this way, or pulled it that way, someone can adjust the device and the pulley would move and then the direction of traction would move based on where the pulley moved. Right. And so I actually invented a shoulder hole that had full six degrees of freedom. You attach it to the operating room table, and now it's made out of aluminum, so it's very lightweight. Right. Um, so then the nurse doesn't have to lug this equipment around. Also you, probably more sterile than rope. Well, actually, we don't sterilize that. 
Okay. You know, so it's interesting. If you put it on the table, it's a fixture of the OR table. Oh, okay. And there is a rope still. <laughs> okay. But then there's a pan piece that goes on that holds the hand that's got, um, another invention is um, force spreading gel. So then when you apply the traction, it instantly spreads the force evenly over all the skin. Oh, wow. Because one of the problems with a lot of the traction devices tends to bind up at the wrist. Sure. And all the force concentrated there, and you take it off at the end of the case, the wrist is bright red. Yeah. But if you have force spreading gel, it's, it's spread over the whole arm. It self sets itself to the tension. Yeah. And you can apply traction for two hours, and you're not going to have a skin problem. Or, yeah. or much more reduced problems with the skin. So this is another invention later on. But um, so anyway, so, so having done that... Um, I got a patent on that. It was my first patent. Yeah. And back in the day when I did that, it, the patent office wasn't as sticky as it is now. Like all the drawings are hand drawings of oh, it wow. that are actually in the final patent, which they don't accept anymore. It has right. to be a true mechanical drawing. Yeah. And uh, it was very, you know, I did it pretty much by myself. Um, now, how did did you do? You have a shed somewhere that you go to tinker well, with yeah, stuff. So this or? one actually, I had. Um, the first one, the grasper thing, you know, I posed the idea to J&J, &J, and back then they were very desperate for new instruments, so they would sure. make you a prototype if you said anything. Draw it on a napkin, they made it for you. Oh, wow. And they made the 27 versions of it <laughs> <laughs> before we finally made the real one. Right. Uh, this other one, I befriended someone who had a marine shop nearby in, in Connecticut. Yeah. And I said, you know, I have this idea, you think you make it? And the guy goes, oh, yeah, we can make that. Because uh, we make marine stuff, so like, yeah. You know, so like steel tubes and and you know flanges, and you cut the you know cut the parts and yeah. then put it all together. And then the second time I had it made, they they were not able to make it. So I went to another guy, and he misunderstood the weight requirement. Oh, so he thought that the arms were very heavy for some reason, and the traction force were very high. So he made it. You could put an elephant's arm in it. <laughs> it was so strong. It's a bit much. But the nurses couldn't pick it up. <laughs> oh, because it was, <laughs> it was so heavy. double walled steel. It weighed a lot. Yeah. Know? So then the third time I actually found a local manufacturer in Connecticut called uh, Innovative Medical Products, which mm -hmm. is a small manufacturer that does a lot of medical supplies for right. positioning on tables and things like that. And they made a version that's all aluminum. Yeah. And that one is very lightweight and very flexible and usable. And it's, you know, it's used in a lot of places. It's kind of neat. And your um, inventions or innovations haven't always been in the physical space, right? Didn't you invent some stuff or... Um, like some search engine optimization yeah, yeah. type things. You hold two patents in that yeah. realm as well. Yeah. Again, when you sleep at night and you wake up with a crazy idea, you, yeah. can't, you can't help yourself. But, but I have several, I have, a, I have five patents in orthopedic stuff, yeah. fluid management, shoulder holders, things like that, cannulas for, for arthroscopy and those patents. Right. And then um, more recently, I decided that the internet is controlled by the wrong person. Right. It's, it's controlled by the average ad advocate of everyone's thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. You go and you look up something and Google tells you what the last million people wanted. Right. Right? So if you want to find something unusual, it's actually quite hard. Yeah. But if you, and, and the funny story is like if um, you go to a classroom of kids, you say, write a paper about Hamlet, you know, and they all Google Hamlet and they all get the synopsis and they all write the same paper because yeah. they get the top 10 results and everyone gets the same top 10 results. Yeah, no one's going past the first two pages of search exactly, results. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I said to myself, well, how do you get past the first two pages and find things serendipity that you don't know right. about that you'd want to know about? Right. So I came up with this idea that we uniquely know, and this is the first patent of the two patents, we uniquely know better what we don't want mm -hmm. than what we do want. So, if, for example, we're going to restaurants and you have six guys in the room, right? And yeah. you say, where do you want to go? And the first guy raises it, I do not want Chinese. Right. I mean, that's what they say, right? Yeah. And the other guy says, well, uh, I'm not going to India and I had it last week, I'm sick to my stomach, right? Yeah. Whatever it is. I mean, no offense to any typical food, sure, but, yeah, yeah. but you know, someone might have, or you know, I need gluten-free, you know, whatever yeah. it is. But but most people will tell you the things they don't want. They won't come to a consent say, right. oh, I absolutely want this tonight. Yeah. Because they don't want to offend the rest of the crowd, right? But they, yeah. but they won't do it. So I said, well, what if we could do that idea in search? What if we can tell the engine what I don't want from the answers you gave me and have AI figure out what that really means yeah. and scan a whole block of results and reorder that scan of results in a way that makes sense for what I'm thinking, but I haven't told you what I'm thinking yet. Right. Okay. So, so I actually created an app for this. Yeah. And uh, it's available for the iPhone. <laughs> what is the name of the app? It's called Twiddle It. Yeah, Twiddle It. Tw Twiddle It Search. Did yeah. you come up with that name? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's to whittle it, to yeah. whittle it down. Yeah, right? to whittle it down. Yeah, so twiddle it down. So twiddle it. So, um, so the app, what it does is that you get, you put a search term in, mm -hmm. and you see the answers. And what you do is just swipe two or three of them. You can swipe right or left. So if you like it or you don't like it. Right. 
And once you've done that, you hit the toilet button and the AI engine takes the information from the swipes, negative right. and positive, right. and it goes through the remaining results in the set of results and it reorders them based on your thoughts, based on what you swiped by determining what it thinks is in common on the swipes and the remaining results. Right. And also what's less common, and then it gives a score, ranking. Mm -hmm. So the most negative is closest to the negative swipes and the most positive is closest to the positive swipes and it just ranks them down and it represents the same results in that order. Right. So you can imagine what bubbles up to the top are things closer to what you want. Sure. And it actually works. It's kind of crazy when you see it because it took a year to actually do it with a whole bunch of computer geeks and gurus. Yeah. And uh, so, do you actually go in there and program that code yourself, or do you come up with the idea and yeah, then so sort of outsource it? Because I'd imagine you're super busy, but yeah, building out busy. that infrastructure yeah. from a uh, you know programming standpoint would be difficult. Yeah. So, I when I was in high school and college, and I did a lot of programming. Yeah. And, and you I have did a background all kinds of stuff. And a lot of background. So, so I could have done it myself. Sure. But the amount of man hours to do it myself and practice orthopedics right. and do all the other things I'm doing was impossible. So I actually hired a team of engineers. Yeah. And then we would meet every uh, every week. We'd have a, a like a webinar kind of meeting, yeah. you know, or, or a live Zoom in meeting. Um, actually on Zoom, actually it was quite quite interesting doing that. Yeah. And we would sit with the engineers and me and I would review what they did and talk about what we thought. And right. then we look at the graphic presentation and how it worked and problems with, you know, certain areas that became glitches. Right. You know, uh, for example, like to do movies, but if you do movies and you do it like a common search for movies, mm -hmm. it isn't really as satisfying as if you go to a movie database. Right. And just do the search in that. Right. So if you put in movies right now, what it does is it gives you the standard Google type result. But if you, if you um, ask for featured movies, it will go into a movie database and only give you about the movies themselves. And it'll oh, okay. take out all the extraneous movie results like the interviews with people. Right. Uh, if you want to look at a certain genre, you could do it that way. Or yeah. you could swipe and it'll sort based on your swipes. Right. Again, the movies based on the preface. So I said, I don't want to see a horror movie. I swipe away that one. But I really want to see the movie about Donald Duck. I swipe that one. Right. And all of a sudden the Disney movies pop to the bottom, you know, top and the horror yeah. movies pop to the bottom. And then you can kind of get a decision about that. Excellent. Uh, one of my partners said that, um, he says, great for date night, you know, like you can't decide with your girlfriend what kind of movie to watch, but you can each get a couple of swipes and do the toilet button. <laughs> and then you can see what pops to the top, which is a movie neither of you thought about, but, right. but answers the question because it's a movie that you haven't seen. Yeah. And yet it, it's something you could see that you might both enjoy. <laughs> and technically it, counts as compromise. That's right. And it counts as a digital <laughs> version of compromise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I grew up sort of a science fiction nerd. So mm -hmm. um, like when you th say things like AI, I think of like Isaac Asimov and his three rules and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know that everyone will have that background, I guess. So can you sort of high level what, when we talk to, about artificial intelligence, which is AI, what, yeah. what we're referring to? So this is, this is my favorite thing to talk about in a lot of <laughs> ways because people will be shocked what AI really is. Yeah. So AI truthfully is any activity that a device, a machine or an object or something that does that would have been done by human thought, mm -hmm. all right? So now, you, so you would ask the question like, what is the first time you see AI in history, right? Yeah. And you know, some people say, well, you know, AI was this big meeting in Dartmouth in 1950s and these guys got together and they decided to create this whole idea of a perceptron, which is an electronic version of a human neuron. Mm -hmm. And they decided if they wired them all together, we can create a brain that was electronic and we could teach the brain how to do stuff and we're gonna get artificial intelligence to be able to solve every problem in the world. Right. And then it kind of crashed because no one could make enough perceptrons. It was very expensive, right? Yeah. And so, you know, and I don't know if people remember back, but if you had a megabyte of memory in the 1960s, it cost $2 million. <sighs> and a megabyte of memory today cost about a hundredth of a, or a thousandth of a penny. I think it's less yeah. than a thousandth of a penny now for one megabyte. Yeah. It's like so little. So the difference between that, you know, and, and that cost is all the difference in the world. In the 1960s, they couldn't solve any problems, really. They just no, didn't have absolutely. enough memory to do it, do it. It blows my mind that we were able to get to the moon in the 60s. With, yeah, I well, have much more data capability yeah. on my phone than oh, they did then. Than, than the whole world had. Yeah, it's amazing. And one phone has more data capability yeah. than the entire world did in the 1960s. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uncanny the difference. Your phone would be billions of dollars today. <laughs> yeah. if it was, imagine it was $2 million per megabyte. Oh, yeah. And you have a one gig phone. Yeah. It, you could buy countries. It, yeah, you could buy a country for what your phone is worth. Yeah. So, yeah, so that order of magnitude, people, it's hard for people to wrap their head around that. Right. But what I'm going to say something that's even crazier is that <laughs> AI goes back even further. Like, Da Vinci had these things called the cart, which was like a little cart you could program, and he made a mechanical lion for Venice's 
200th or 300th anniversary, uh -huh. and he envisioned a mechanical knight, and he had drawings for all these things, and they yeah. would be artificially run, right? He'd have a little program in it, and it would do whatever it- Like automatons, I think Automatons, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. So Da Vinci did that, but then, and then after Da Vinci, there was Babbage, I don't know if you know that, right? Babbage was the guy who did the, the difference uh, calculator, where he mm -hmm. actually solved, solved multivariable equations with a calculator, it was mechanical with gears. Yeah. Uh, and then there was uh, Ada Lovelace, who was who's actually um, she had a computer program language named after her. Right. Yeah. She was the first person to see Babbage's drawings of his calculating machine, and she decided she could create an algorithm for that machine to solve bigger problems than it was designed for. Ah. And so she's credited as being the mother of programming. He's yes. The father of computers. Ah. So you say, okay, AI goes back to then. I say, no, no, no that's not even true. Go to Stonehenge. <laughs> All right. So yeah. Think about this for a second. Stonehenge was erected, and when the sun was in certain positions, mm -hmm. everything would line up, and the beam of light would come between the rocks. Yeah, and that would give you seasons, right? Yeah, and you tell you when to plant and when to right. But if you had to look at the sun and calculate and check the stars and try to figure it out on your own, it would be a lot of brain work. Yeah, right. So what if we created a device that did the calculation for us? Yeah. And we put these rocks up so when the photons of the sun hit the rocks in the right way, the answer would appear on the ground. Literally. Or a yeah. sundial. Yeah. Right? That would be AI. Yeah. A machine that does some thought for us that replaces human activity. Right. Right? So anything that does that, your watch does that. Absolutely. What time of the day it is, right? Yeah. Any computer does that regularly. Most of that we would consider shallow AI. Mm -hmm. All right? So this is, this is the distinction, right? Right. So shallow AI is a device, you know, I programmed it. I know what it's going to do. Right. Uh, easy one is you go to a BMI calculator, you want to know your body mass index, yeah. right? See if you're, you're dieting properly or whatever, and you put your, your height and your weight in, and it gives you your BMI, right? Well, it's a formula, it's a calculation, it's, it's AI yeah. in a way, it does the calculation for you. That's a simple one, right? Yeah. Um, but others are much more complicated. But right. all of those are, a human sat down and said, okay, we got this problem, let's get a piece of paper out, let's get a pencil, let's get a computer, let's find, figure out a formula, let's create a approximation to the answer right and or maybe even accurate perfectly accurate answer and then we're going to put it into a program and create a device and we don't care what buttons are on it like your iPhone could have any button on it mm -hmm. right a calculator has less buttons on it but we don't care what buttons you use to activate it but it's going to get an input and give me the output right hey Siri right, <laughs> right? absolutely right yeah. now Siri's a little more sophisticated than that but but initially it wasn't yeah initially there might have been, you know if you go back to the original cars that had voice commands they understood six or seven words. Mm -hmm. There was an algorithm to make sure they understood those six or seven words. Right. To understand, uh, call Tom. You know, right. it would be call, and the phone would activate. That yeah. would all you could do. Um, but that was all done by algorithm. It was written. Some guy figured it out. Right. Now you go ahead and say, okay, that's shallow. So there's a ton of shallow AI. It's shallow. You can't go right. two inches anywhere. You can't miss shallow AI. It's everywhere. Right. Now you go to deep AI. What's deep AI? Deep AI is okay. Let's emulate learning. Mm -hmm. Right. And let's create, take these positive, the, these perceptrons, and we'll make a, a network and layers that look really like a retina. Yeah. Right? Because if you look at the retina, the way the retina works, you get light in the front, you have a layer of neurons that get activated, there's another layer of neurons that process it, there's another layer of neurons, there's optic nerve brings it to the optic brain, there's more layers, and then at the end, you say, oh, it's a cat. Right. Or it's a dog, or whatever. Right. So that's what, so what, when AI is learning, it's saying, okay, I show you a picture of this article on AI, right? Right. And the computer gets all this information in its visual cortex, right? And then it says, oh, these are letters, right? right? And one layer, another layer says, let's break them down, what letters they are, right? And go on and go on. And I could program that all in, but if I do it the other way, say so I've got millions of letters and characters and words, and I keep showing it to the computer over and over again, and I keep telling the computer what the outcome should be. Yeah. Eventually, it creates all these factors in the middle of all these layers of neurons to make it work. Right. It and does it the learning for you. It does the learning, right. just like your brain does. Right. And then you give it a mystery one, and it tells you the answer, right? And the true test is if it gets the answer right on that next one. Right. And yeah. the one after that. Yeah. Then, now, there's a lot of assumptions there, right? And and that's I think that's the... I'm, as I'm writing my series of articles in AI, one of the right. things I'm, I'm writing about now is is uh, the next article that's going to come out is talk about some of the assumptions we're making. And, and the first assumption is the data we show it is representative of the real world. Yeah. Right? Sometimes we show data, it's not really representative of the real world. It's, sure. It's just a fantasy set of information. Yeah. And, and that data represents not only the real world now, but some of the real world in the future. Because if I take a future problem 
right? My assumption is words and letters aren't going to change. And if I show words and right. letters to the computer, the future words and letters are going to be the same words and letters right. now. If I change languages on the computer, it's going to be lost, right? So the assumption number one is that I'm representing the real world I'm dealing in. And assumption number two is that the real world I'm representing now is the same world I'm going to be asking you questions about in the future. Right. So those are the big, big assumptions. And then the data collection is similar, right? So, so in, in medicine, one of the problems we might have is, um, for example, if I have an x-ray and I take it on an x-ray machine and I do AI and I say, find the tumor, and I teach it, I find tumor, it's perfect. Now I go to another x-ray machine and I do the same problem, but the voltage is different, the tube distance is different, mm -hmm. the x-ray film that I'm using is a different uh, digital CR you know, recorder that, that yeah. records slightly differently. There's different noise because one building is well shielded from RF and the other one's next to a radio station. And now all of a sudden the data I get in isn't exactly the same, even though to the human eye it looks pretty similar. Yeah. And AI would have trouble with that. Yeah. Because the, the, the source, that I didn't give AI to learn 25 different units to learn from right. representing all the x-ray units out there in the future, right? I just did my one machine's worth of data and now I try to train it to do that problem and it does it well, but now all of a sudden I present it with something that has a different set of noise and background. Yeah. So AI has, the, so the, and there's more things we can talk about, but sure. there's, there's a lot of assumptions underneath AI that people don't wrap their head around so well. So AI is great, but then mm -hmm. it has some pitfalls. So what are some of those pitfalls of AI? There's so many ways to, to approach it. We, we talk about what happened when they did, they made an AI bot for uh, social media. It was a very popular concept, right? So yeah. you make a bot, you say, okay, I have an AI bot and I'm gonna pretend that I'm like a person mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna read social media stuff mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna regurgitate appropriate answers when people write me. Right. So I'm pretending I'm on Facebook and I'm a person, but I'm really an AI bot. Right. And what do I learn? I learn what I see, Yeah. right? So quickly the AI bot becomes a bigot and prejudiced <laughs> and angry and yeah. cursing, right? Yeah. And 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 only tells, uh, you know, horrible things, <laughs> yeah. right? Because it amplifies what it sees. Sort of garbage in, garbage out. Right, and yeah. it's learned what you taught it, but then sometimes you might be scared what we taught it is yeah. what we do and reflects upon us, right? Yeah. So, so um, they've done some experiments like this and some of the AI bots come back with these results that would, you know, are appalling <laughs> because what's out there isn't so good. Right. And so there, the, the assumption is, and, and this is a, there's another assumption here, is that AI itself is, is, has no prejudice, it has no natural language, right. it has no presumptions, and it has no assumptions, right? Yeah. It just learns what, from the data set. Mm -hmm. Problem is, a lot of the data sets have prejudice, built assumptions. In. Yeah, it has <laughs> all those other, things built in. Built in, you know, racial discrimination yeah. sometimes, sex discrimination, there was just an article the other day about women uh, being discriminated by credit card companies, but the AI bot is, is, is done on uh, spending habits and payment histories. Mm. But it turns out that in their data set, that might have been prejudice against a group of women. Yeah. And so the credit card company is not giving in the same credit limit to women as men, and it comes out as a discrepancy. Right. But if they looked at the spending histories, you know, they can't justify the credit limit based on the spending histories traditionally. Right. And that would be true in my house. My wife uses the credit cards. I don't hardly use them at all. <laughs> I take $20, I'm good for the whole week. <laughs> so if they did the credit history, actually her credit history is better than mine because <laughs> yeah. she does most of the spending and paying. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I don't, but in some households, everything's under the man's name. Mm -hmm. So even if the woman does all the work and right. has a job and does the spending and pays the bills, it's credit to him and not to her. Right. And if you do analysis of her credit risk, there's no proof that she's a good payer. Right, because it's looking at just the data set, the not data the set. social right. uh, norms and, that play out. Right, and in my household, we have two separate credit cards because I wanted my wife to have her own credit rating. Yeah. And it turns out in time, hers is better than mine because she does most of the, yeah. I'm busy operating. Yeah. And she does the stuff that has to do with paying all the bills and everything else. Yeah. So, so she's, she's a much better credit risk than I am, <laughs> even though I'm the one out there operating. So how does that play out? Not with credit card companies, but yeah. like with in, in the world of health. What are some mm -hmm. problems that can factor in? Because I could imagine that if you're looking at surgery outcomes, uh, but not taking into account like social determinants, like zip code, is that stuff that you're bumping into when trying to, I guess, implement AI? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and this is a two-edged sword, right? Because if, let's say we, we take away zip code and race and all right. those things and strip the data, mm -hmm. and then we just look at outcomes, 
and let's say because of zip code, someone doesn't have access to certain services right. and doesn't get a certain kind of care because they don't have access. Yeah, and that happens all the time. It happens all the time. So yeah. lack of access, they might end up with a discrepancy. And then the mm-hmm. AI bot may say, look, those people don't do this. I'm not going to offer it to them. Right. Or worse, they're not compliant with treatment because they don't have the ability to do follow-up. So, so then they're at higher risk for complications. So if I ask the AI bot, who should I operate on? Who's going to have the best outcomes? Tell me the patients I should avoid operating on because I don't want to have bad outcomes. Right. It's going to kick out a whole bunch of people who are disadvantaged yeah. in uh, many different ways. And so here's the dilemma, right? If we use AI to improve outcomes in medicine, which is our big goal, right? Yeah. And, we, and we, we, the insurance company takes this data and says, oh, you can't operate on people with BMI over 40 because their outcomes are terrible. Right. But we then don't go back and say, why is there BMI over 40 and what can we do about it? Right. Then we're going to displace a whole bunch of people out of the healthcare system and not going to get care. Right. Moreover, if we, if we use the AI bots to rate the physicians, and this is the big fear because this is sort of happening already. Yeah. Um, and we rate the physicians based on their outcomes. And someone is in an area where people's general health is poor. Yeah. That could their be. outcomes are going to be poor. Yeah. Right. Now, and they may, could be the best surgeon in the world. They're just And it won't be, matter. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And and in fact, what it used to happen is in a lot of, and you know, the tertiary centers, a lot of them would get the worst cases. So if I send all my bad cases to this one center where the outcomes, let's say there's right. a 30% chance of a bad outcome on these patients because they've been referred after failed procedures and this and that. And in, the, in another area, they're just doing the primary procedures and none of the failed procedures because I send them all to the big university. Yeah the outcome profiles are going to look different. They're going to say, don't get operated at the university because you're going to have a bad outcome. (laughs) Yeah. So how do you risk stratify? How do you look at data that way? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, when we put the data in, we presume the data is neutral. We presume that, and the AI machine has no prejudice. Right. But the data isn't always as neutral as we think it is. Right. And And we're sort of building prejudice into the system, even though it doesn't have it inherently. Exactly. If the data has it, it's only going to crunch whatever data it has. Sure. And then, and then I wrote an article about the ethics uh, AI, and, and one of the things that, that's one of the elements, right? Yeah, absolutely. One of the other elements of the ethical issues in AI is autonomy. Like, patients are theoretically, in the United States at least, allowed to have choice. Yeah. And allowed to actively participate in decision-making and make informed dissent, mm-hmm. consent. But what if the insurance company uses AI to deny procedures based on outcomes, and they tell your doctor what procedure he has to do, even though that technique in his hands is not what he's comfortable with. Right. And there might be three operations that are good for that procedure, for that problem. Sure. And the guy's been doing one for 30 years and he happens to be phenomenally good at it. And in his hands, he has great results. Yeah. But if someone is not skilled in that technique, this other technique might be easier for them and they may get good results with that technique. Right. Um, in shoulder surgery, when we do arthroscopy, there, there are people who learned how to do shoulder arthroscopy in the lateral position and people learned how to do it in the beach chair position. Purely a training artifact. Right. Because where you trained and who you worked with kind yeah. of pushed you in one direction or another. Sure. Um, it turns out there are different c- considerations with each. There are advantages and different advantages of each. And it may play out that one might have a higher complication rate than another, but half the surgeons are trained in one and half the surgeons are trained in the other. And the ones who are trained and comfortable in beach chair are not necessarily trained and comfortable with, with lateral. Right. And if you say, now you have to do all your cases lateral as opposed to beach chair because you're going to avoid this complication, yeah. there's going to be a lot of resistance to doing that. Well, and, and possible bad and, outcomes. And uh, probably a lot of bad outcomes in the transition. Yeah. There might be a heavy price paid for some patients yeah. having it done in a way that the surgeon is not comfortable. Right. So um, it, it, there's it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> as you can see, it gets very complicated. So we've talked about some of the pitfalls of AI. Where do you see, and maybe it's not there yet, but where do you see AI going that you're excited about it? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, I'm right, right now I'm beta testing something from a company called Image Biopsy. Mm-hmm. And that company makes a device, AI-driven, where it takes an X-ray mm-hmm. and makes measurements, standard measurements, but they're actually not that hard, not that easy to do accurately uh, because it really requires a visual analysis, right? So I'm looking at a, uh, at something, and I want to know: Is there signs of arthritis in the knee? Mm-hmm. Uh, meaning, are there osteophytes or bone spurs? Is there sclerosis in the bone? Is there loss of joint space? So if I look at an X-ray, I say, "Oh, that looks narrower than the other side." Now I can physically take a caliber and try to measure that. Sure. It's a little arduous; takes a bit of work. But if I can have an AI device that looks at the X-ray and gives me the measurements yeah. in every part of the joint that's important and then gives me a sense of a scoring of how much sclerosis there is and how many bone spurs there are. That could happen very quickly, maybe yeah. in a minute. Yeah. 
And as I'm testing it now, and I'm really, literally, this last two weeks, it just got FDA approved. So, oh, wow. so literally in the last two weeks, this is like a new thing. And it's not out there yet. But I'm starting to try to use it a little bit. And what I'm seeing is that I discovered it today in a patient, they have more arthritis in one part of the knee that I, than I realized when looking visually at it. Mm -hmm. I was a little fooled. It was almost like an optical illusion. Yeah. And when you look at the actual numbers, it tipped me off to a problem that I wasn't thinking about. Mm -hmm. And it probably explains why the person has recurrent swelling. And, and just visually, I probably wouldn't have come to that. And so it was a little of a eureka moment. It actually happened today. Yeah. So oh, I'm wow. kind of excited about yeah. it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I can't wait to report back to them that, that this happened because I yeah. think that in process, when I first looked at it, I said, oh, you know, how valuable could that be? I'm really, you know, I'm interested in AI, you know, so great. I'll do this for you. Sure. I'll look at these things. I'm not sure how valuable it'd be, but then I'm sitting in clinic and I'm looking at this thing. I said, wow, that made me think about it differently. And now I have a different answer for the patient based yeah. on what I just saw. Yeah, and a better answer. And a better answer. And also when I asked for the MRI study, I'm asking for a different question of the radiologist. Mm. So, so it's, it's compounding. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that was a little example of that. The other one that's really interesting is another company I'm a little involved with is, is a company called NHatch. Mm -hmm. And they're out of New Jersey and they take two-dimensional images and create a three-dimensional AI version of it. Oh, wow. And they use it to predict ahead what prosthetic you're going to use to replace the knee or the hip or, or even sure. the spine, put in what size screws you need. So they'll take like a, like a 2D x-ray. So, yeah, plain x-rays from the office. Just make a model of it in, the, and in 3D? the AI system makes a three-dimensional model wow. from the 2D images. Yeah. And you need a marker to make sure you get sizing correct. Right. But then it can go ahead and predict with reasonable accuracy what total hip or total knee you might get. Mm -hmm. And what that does is then it turns around and gives you uh, a more accurate start in the OR. First of all, you kind of know what you're going to do. Right. And you don't need a tray of 27 <laughs> total knees to figure out which one's going to go in. You maybe can make a tray of three or four different ones, bracket on either side of the size you predicted. Sure. Yeah. And the requirement of sterilization, you know, just think about greenhouse gases and all that stuff. Let's yeah. say I'm sterilizing a tray of 27 things every time I do a total knee. <laughs> yeah. And I'm doing 100,000 of them a year, actually, you know, in the United States, probably a million of them a year. Yeah. And then I can go to a tray this big and sterilize it. And how much less energy? Yeah. How much less cleaning? How much water I'm going to use How many less, less chemicals? Chemicals we're going to use yeah. less. You know, um, the cost of the inventory is going to go down. We're going to do something indirectly through AI by figuring out ahead of time what size knee replacement to put in that's going to, that's going to help us with our environmental problems. Yeah. So it, that, that to me is kind of neat. Yeah. It just kind of blows me away that, that the implications of some of the things we do, we don't really fully understand either. So like you get this one idea, it's really great, it's going to make surgery easier, blah, 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 but you know, mm -hmm. what's the downstream effect of that? Well, we might save some energy, we might use less water, it might be better for the planet. Right. Yeah. Right. So that, so that, you know, that's kind of neat. So I'm excited about those two right now. Yeah. There's other things on the horizon. Uh, I have some ideas about how I might use my Twiddlet idea of how to use that for medical diagnosis. Oh yeah. Um, Build yeah. a better WebMD. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I think, I think the problem for a lot of people is I, I go on WebMD and I don't know what I'm looking at. I right. can't figure out my way around. So and you're I, terrified. And you're terrified. So yeah. there's, there's, and my next patent has something to do. I said, I can't really talk about it. Too but yeah, much. don't don't give it away. <laughs> yeah. It so much. But my next patent has something to do with that. that awesome. Approaching that problem. So I'd like to close with one just sort of final question because you've been in the industry so long and you have sort of a unique path. Uh, I'd be surprised if you don't have you know younger doctors coming to you for advice. So what advice do you give those who are maybe freshly out of their residency or fellowship about sort of embarking on a career in this space? Yeah, so this is this is the zillion dollar question, right? Because right. people people do ask me that. I'm sure. And I think the frustration for some people is they're trying to guess ahead what's going to be 20 years from now. Right. And the truth is, no one knows. We we have no window on it. You know, right. so many things. I mean, if you ask me, and in, in, you know, again, we talked about things I did when I started my practice, right? And how I operate now. There isn't a single procedure I do the same way. There isn't, there isn't yeah. anything I do the same way, and all the techniques are different. And even if I invented some of the instruments, they didn't exist. Yeah. So um, everything is very different. Um, but the cool thing is this, everything's very different. Yeah. So I think the advice I give people is you gotta do what you like and love, and, mm -hmm. you, and, you, gotta, and you gotta do things you're good at. So you can marry what you're good at and what you love. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna serve you well, because it's gonna show on a daily basis. So. You know, you're there, you're doing stuff, you're excited about it. People know you're excited about it. They, they get, it's infectious, right? Yeah. People gravitate to people who are excited about what they're doing. That's absolutely true. And, and you're better at what you do if you're excited about it. Yeah. So 
I, I always worry that people say, oh, this will be a great career because I'll make a lot of money. Right. The people who make the most money are the people who went into something because they purely were crazy about it, loved <laughs> it so much, worked so hard at it. Yeah. They, they, they came up with some idea in that area because they were so excited about whatever yeah. they were doing that they became a gazillionaire because of that. Now, that hasn't happened to me yet, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, that isn't even important anymore for me at this point. Right. You know, it's funny. It's, to me, it, it's the process of inventing. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the knowledge of creating something new. It's the hopes that other people might might get some benefit for it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a cool thing if I made a little instrument, J&J &J sells it, and there's a guy in Japan using it every day. Yeah. And I don't even know the guy. The guy doesn't know I invented it. But I know there are Japanese people getting shoulder surgeries where they're moving sutures around inside their shoulder. And right, right now while we're talking, there might be someone holding my instrument in their hand and doing yeah. something with it. it it's something, it's, it's just... Yeah, it's it's a thing, you know. How do you how do you get your, wrap your head around that? I can't, <laughs> I, you know. It, it's just a crazy thing. So yeah. so there's some there's a huge pleasure in that, and and I think at the end of the day, if you can take those pleasures out of what you do, everything else doesn't matter really, because yeah. you know it, it makes things better for you. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Resnick, thank you so much for taking the time today. It's we really appreciate pleasure. you coming on the podcast. Oh, so glad to talk to you. Yeah, this thank is you. excellent. Thank it's you. A pleasure.